Life Audio. Faith Over Fear is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith affirming podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. I'm Jennifer Slattery, and I know life can feel pretty crazy at times, right? Pretty uncertain. And when we land in a crisis, when we face a seemingly insurmountable problem, it's easy to feel like a victim to our circumstances. But if we've trusted in Christ for salvation, Scripture tells us that we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. More than conquerors. So like a blowout game where the home team didn't just win, but dominated a 45-0 to zero victory. Because if Christ, the victorious, risen, all-powerful Savior, is for us, Who or what could possibly stand against us? I discuss this in detail in my presentation on finding joy in the holy battle. If you would like to book me or another Holy Love speaker for your next event, I encourage you to contact us through the Holy Love website. I will put our web address in the show notes. We love helping people step into all the blessings that Christ secured for them, the grace showered upon them, the power through the Holy Spirit first unleashed in them and then through them, and their position as a cherished, held, protected, guided, and carried child of God. Because we are in Christ, meaning that we identify with, we yield to, and rely upon Him, we know whatever lies ahead of us, whatever battle we fight, we have already won. We begin with that truth, regardless of how we feel. We are coming from a place of victory, seized by Christ when he died and rose again. Our role isn't to obtain victory, but rather to humbly and confidently take hold of that which Christ already secured. Recognizing that, realizing that was a game changer for me. If you've listened to many past Faith Over Fear episodes, you've probably come to realize what a complete mess I was prior to yielding my life to Christ. My faith journey isn't exactly linear. I first received God's free gift of salvation as a young child. I'm not certain how old I was. No one marked or celebrated that day, but I do know it was sometime before my third grade year. I also know that moment of surrender was real. It left a permanent imprint on my mind. But I never moved past that moment. I never grew for a long time. And in fact, there was a time where my life just spiraled out of control. Actually, that's not quite true. That makes it sound as if I was a victim to outside forces. And while perhaps there's a fraction of truth in that, as we're all caught up in a cosmic battle for good versus evil, whether we choose to engage in that battle or not, but it was my response to the world's chaos that nearly destroyed me and would have destroyed me, if not for Christ. In less than a year's time, I went from an honor roll student, from a track and cross-country runner determined to excel, to homelessness and spending most of my nights and sometimes days as well, drunk. I knew God was with me. His spirit testified to my spirit that he was there. And I also knew my way of living deeply grieved his heart. But I didn't know the way out. I didn't believe there was a way out, although I regularly asked him for one. Praise God, he heard my cries for help. He pulled me out of my self-induced prison, and he placed my feet firmly upon the unshakable foundation of Jesus Christ. But that was just the beginning of my journey. I needed to learn to grab hold of all Christ through his death and resurrection had given me. I first got plugged into church culture in the mid-90s, which seemed to be the decade of strongholds. Everyone seemed a bit obsessed with spiritual warfare, and in my opinion, they gave much too much power and too much focus to the devil. Yes, he is out to get us. Yes, he is out to trip us up, to enslave us, and, and enslave us to fear, to bitterness, to sin, whatever he can use to hinder our freedom and derail us from experiencing the full and radiant life to which God has called us. But we must remember he is a defeated foe, or as Charles Spurgeon once phrased it, a stingless dragon. Don't you love that? He wrote, the enemy may rush in upon you with hideous noise and terrible alarms, but there is no real cause for fear. And learning that, that just makes all the difference. It helps us to approach every encounter, every situation with confidence. Now that's the journey we're all on. That's the journey we'll remain on until the day Christ brings us to our eternal home. The journey of grabbing hold of that for which Christ grabbed hold of us. 
Consider this quote from author and pastor Alan D. Wright, quote, spiritual victory is not something you earn, it is something you accept, end quote. And what if we don't? What if we moment by moment and thought by thought feed our fears rather than our faith? Well, we rob ourselves of so very much. As my former guest and prolific author Neil T. Anderson once wrote, speaking on those fears that are neither imminent or potent, quote, an irrational fear is a thief. It erodes our faith plunders our hope, steals our freedom, and takes away our joy of living the abundant life in Christ, end quote. And then comparing phobias, which I believe he used in reference to all irrational fears, if my memory is correct, he went on to write that they are, quote, like the coils of a snake. The more we give in to them, the tighter they squeeze. Tired of fighting, we succumb to the temptation and surrender to our fears. But what seems like an easy way out becomes, in reality, a prison of unbelief a fortress of fear that holds us captive, end quote. And I'm reminded of the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. I'm going to discuss that period of history more thoroughly in an upcoming episode and also on the Your Daily Bible Verse podcast. But in short, God had promised his people land, quote, flowing with milk and honey, meaning a spacious place of rest and abundance. But out of fear, the tribal leaders and adults refused to enter. They became so blinded by the obstacles that they forgot or maybe discounted the power and the presence of their God, the God who had liberated them from Egypt through a series of undeniable miracles, miracles that proved his power and authority over nature, over people, and over powerful rulers. What might have happened if standing on the other side of the Jordan, they had paused in the middle of their fear to remind themselves of who they were? God's chosen and beloved people, and who God was, who God is, the ever-present, all-knowing, unconquerable creator of the universe who is always, always in control over the big things and the little things. We live in victory when we believe, when we hold tight to and remind ourselves of, when we inform our emotions of what we know to be true. And so that's where I want to start today's episode learning to recognize our power in Christ, which means also learning to recognize places in which we fall into an orphan mentality, which is basically where we live as if we don't have God and therefore as if we're forced to survive in our harsh and often chaotic world on our own, relying on our own wisdom and our own strength, or maybe living as if we are smart and strong enough to conquer life's battles alone, apart from Christ, when in reality, It's our weakness and our dependence or our realization and our acceptance of just how weak we are and then our dependence based on that realization that leads to supernatural strength. In Christ, you and I are amply, abundantly supplied. Ephesians 1 verse 3 states, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Not some blessings. Not partial blessings, not blessings we must work hard and hit some standard to achieve in order to receive, but blessings God the Father has already given us because of our faith in Christ. These blessings include being adopted into God's family as his beloved child, claimed as his own possession, the treasure he counted worthy of his son's life, forgiveness for all of our sins, every sin we've already committed, and every sin we might commit in the future. And that's great news for anyone who fears that they've blown it, that they've out God's grace, as if his grace were limited, which it is not. We have received grace upon grace, or more grace upon the unfathomable grace that we've already received. We've been granted the gift of eternal life, which means today won't have the final say, and one day our pain and our hardships will end. We've also been given the mind of Christ. Pause to think on that for a moment. Are you facing a really hard, maybe even confusing decision? Maybe you're a parent doing your best to raise a rebellious teenager or a child with special needs, and you're uncertain as to the best course of action. Or maybe you're trying to hold tight to a struggling marriage or to save a failing business. Whatever your challenge, know this. You currently possess the mind of Christ. If you belong to Jesus, if you have trusted in Christ for salvation, you possess the mind of Christ, 
which got questions defines as, quote, sharing the plan, purposes, and perspective of Christ, adding, and it is something all believers possess. It's something we grow into. We learn to access more efficiently, more consistently, but it's something that scripture tells us we have been given in Christ. We also have guidance from the indwelling Holy Spirit who whispers perfect wisdom for every situation and perfect insight into every dilemma and encounter. He tells us what to say, what to do, when to speak and to act, when to remain silent, when to remain still. And according to 1 Peter 1 verse 3, regardless of how weak and fragile, how ill-prepared and ill-equipped we feel, you and I have the power in Christ to obey however he leads. The Holy Spirit speaks words of assurance to our souls, reminding us that he always has a plan, a good and hope-filled plan, that he sees our lives from beginning to end, that he fights on our behalf. He continually leads us towards increased joy and peace, two soul states we already possess as well, that Christ has already given us. He has given us his peace and his joy. Blessings we acquired through faith that we now need to learn to grab hold of. And so like Paul, the first century church planter who wrote the book of Ephesians, we pray that God will give us, quote, the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know him better. We pray that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which he has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power, Ephesians 1 tells us, is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is evoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. God's power within us anchors us in faith and grounds us in his love. He speaks words of love and assurance over us and courage and purpose within us. In Christ, we have the power to resist temptation, to experience spiritual victory in every situation, to accomplish everything God assigns, and to faithfully do all that he's asked. Do you believe that? Not just now when you're listening to this podcast, but in your moments of stress, fatigue, and fear as well. God wants us to grab hold of those truths and to yield more consistently to him because that is when his power is most unleashed within us. God changes and strengthens us internally. He goes deeper than grit your teeth and try harder external efforts. He breaks the power of sin and the power of fear in our lives and he empowers us to overcome. Or perhaps to phrase it differently, he simultaneously breaks the power of one, the sin and the fear that we battle, while increasing the power of the other, us. To quote Nathan Johnson, owner of the Deeper Christian blog, the victorious life is not one which merely makes our outward actions right. It is a life which gives victory in the inner realm of the heart so that our very desires are right. To want to do wrongful things and to restrain from doing them is not real victory. The wonderful thing is that God takes the want to out of our very hearts and we long only to do his will. And this is great news because his will always leads us to more vibrant life, to everything that ignites our souls. Can you imagine what our lives might look like if we lived fully surrendered to and empowered by Christ in each moment? Can you imagine the depth of our confidence believing everything God throughout scripture declared to us? He promised you and I, all who believe in Christ, incomparable power. Like I said earlier, the same power that brought a corpse that had been lying in a grave for three days back to life. The same power that retains full authority and control over every leader, system, and all the forces of darkness from now through eternity, because we belong to, are surrounded by, and held close to the one who reigns over all and fills our souls with himself. The closer our connection with Christ and the greater our reliance on him, the greater our victory. I'm going to say that again. The closer our connection 
with Christ, and the greater our reliance on him, the greater our victory. As 19th century theologian Alexander McLaren once said, quote, we can have as much of God as we want. And this makes me ask myself, why would I ever settle for less than what God wants to give me? What could I possibly value more than the power and the presence of God? Sadly, at times, my fear and my pride get in the way, and surrender is the antidote to both. You can probably understand why this is true for pride, but you might be confused as to how surrender relates to fear. Through surrender, I am deliberately relinquishing control to the one greater than me, which in turn makes me better able to hear him and more alert to his presence. In Colossians 3, verse 15, scripture tells us to, quote, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. The peace of Christ reminds me of the numerous other verses that call God the God of peace. Peace comes from him and our reliance on him, not from within ourselves or the best self-help book we can find. We experience his supernatural peace to the extent that we let him rule. Now, don't exhaust yourself fighting the bad, but rather refresh yourself by yielding to the good, to the power and the presence of Christ within. Apart from surrender, we will never experience soul deep peace because every moment we live unsurrendered, we are basically living at war within ourselves. In Galatians 5.17, we read, quote, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. So basically, God's spirit within us, the part of us that has been made new, it wars with our sin. When we follow sinful desires, we are at war within ourselves. And this steals our peace and our joy, and it robs us of the power that Christ died to give us. It endangers us to deception, and it leaves us increasingly vulnerable to sin, which then again creates more inner chaos. To live filled with the Spirit, we must first empty ourselves of everything that gets in Christ's way. So this means regularly practicing confession. And I think sometimes that word scares us, especially if we are raised in a legalistic rule-based environment where people in authority, be they parents, teachers, priests, or pastors, seem to take joy in discovering our weakness and our sin and not to help us find freedom, but instead to chastise us and make us feel terrible about ourselves. But that's not God's heart. He leads us to confession because he wants to lead us to freedom, to break the power of sin in our lives. The cross of Christ proved that he is for us, for our joy, our peace, our growth, and our freedom. Therefore, when he reveals something harmful within us, it is always, always because he wants to set us free. The process of him slicing out our spiritual tumors, if you will, it often feels painful, but man, does it feel good when he's done. When we're standing on the healing side of a broken relationship, of an addiction, or a devastating habit. Unfortunately, old habits, as they say, are hard to break. As Dr. Neil T. Anderson wrote in Bondage Breaker, when you become a new creation in Christ, no one pushed the delete button in your memory bank. And you probably, maybe you feel that quote. Maybe you have been there. You're like, wow, why do I keep following these old patterns of behavior? Well, because we haven't retrained ourselves. Each time we grab hold of fearful, self-defeating thoughts, every time we refuse to feed them and we focus on truth instead, and each time we live surrendered and empowered to Christ, we are, in essence, rebooting our brains. We're learning to recognize and then to stop harmful thought patterns, and then we're intentionally reminding ourselves of, and we're intentionally focusing on truth. As Alex Ely, a minister at my church, once said, take aim of your thoughts because your thoughts aim you. I love that. They, they aim our emotions and our actions. You may be thinking, yeah, right. If only it were that easy. You have no idea how strong my anxious thoughts can become, to which I'd say, as someone who still battles obsessive compulsive disorder, I get it. I know it's tough, but I also know Jesus is greater. And as I said earlier, you and I possess resurrection power. I don't believe that's a hyperbole or some catchy phrase that God put into scripture to give us something to talk about. 
I believe God told us that, speaking that truth first to a group of believers living during a time of crisis, of intense persecution, because he meant it. And because he wanted us to hold tight to that truth, to live as if we truly believe his words are true. Did you catch the episode with my conversation with Jennifer Tucker, author of Breathe as Breath Prayer, Breath as Prayer? I, I always get it wrong. I apologize. <laughs> Breathe as Prayer. Anyways, about a month ago, if not, and you really struggle to control your anxious thinking, I encourage you to go back and take a listen. It's episode 109. And in it, she shared a time when she felt too anxious to pray when her thoughts were just kind of spiraling all over the place. And so she began by repeating scripture as a prayer. And this does a few things. First, God's word preserved in the Bible, it holds supernatural power. In fact, it is our only offensive weapon among those listed in Ephesians chapter six. So that's where all of our spiritual weapons are listed. It was also how Jesus, God's son, defeated Satan, his and our greatest spiritual enemy, and the one who incidentally plants fears into our minds. You might be familiar with that passage of scripture. It's found in Matthew chapter four. I'm not going to go into it into huge detail, except to say each time Satan came at Jesus, Jesus calmly but firmly quoted scripture immediately defusing Satan. Each time that was like Jesus's mic drop moment, the final say on the matter. Through scripture, we also connect more deeply with the God of scripture, the one who stands with us, fights for us, and surrounds us with his love. Our position in Christ is a position of security and power. And that is where we are at this moment. Recognizing that truth, it changes everything, and it helps us rise above today's greatest challenges. I love what Tony Evans wrote in his book, Free at Last, quote, the Christian life was never meant to be lived from a limited ground level position. If we want to live as victorious, liberated Christians, we need to elevate our position so that we rise above ground level and see the big picture. Whenever you change your position, by necessity, you change your perspective. And scripture helps give us that new perspective by connecting us with Christ on a deeper level and by building his truth into our minds. When we pray scripture, we're reminding ourselves of truth, and therefore we are retraining our brains to think not on fear or falsehoods, but on truth. So let's practice a bit using one of the most often quoted passages in relation to anxiety and fear, Philippians chapter four. Beginning in verse four and continuing through verse nine, we read, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your greatness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Now, this passage begins with rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in who God is verbally through praise music or through your prayers. I notice a difference in my mood and the general atmosphere in my home when I have worship music playing throughout the day, even if I don't really pay attention to the lyrics. Although I probably, I'm, I'm sure I'm getting some of it, at least subconsciously. But I like to think of this as sort of staking God's claim over my home and my heart as a declaration that this space belongs to him. Rejoicing in Christ also involves speaking words of praise. Have you ever done that when you're feeling anxious? Have you ever just paused to journal on all that you know to be true about God? During particularly anxious times, I suggest that you actually do that. You actually write your praise out because for me, at least, the act of writing, of focusing to some extent on moving my pen across the page it helps me slow down my thoughts and, and, and focus my unruly thoughts onto truth. If that feels hard, you could start by simply saying or writing, Lord, I rejoice in you. Repeating that prayer as many times as you need to. Lord, I rejoice in you. Lord, I rejoice in you. Why do we rejoice? Because he is good and loving, powerful, faithful, and attentive. Yes, but also according to verse 5, 
because he is near. He is with us. And this is true whether we feel him or not, because when we're anxious or when we're in the throes of a panic attack, we probably won't feel him. Therefore, we will need to choose to believe what scripture states is true, that our God is near. According to Psalm 46, verse 1, he is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. The God who holds all power and controls all things, who is for us and not against us, stands with us. That means we will never face a problem, a decision, or a battle alone. And as verse 6 demonstrates, he wants us to come to him when we're afraid, to ask for his help, and to trust that he wants to give it, that he truly wants to help us experience soul-deep joy and peace. This passage in Philippians 4, it also tells us to pray with thanksgiving. And I think I've discussed this before, but it's worth mentioning again. Incidentally, if there's a topic you would love for me and my team to cover, please reach out to me through our website. You can find our website again in the show notes. Research demonstrates that practicing gratitude can be a powerful way to defuse our fears, in part because whenever we're focusing on something we're thankful for, we aren't focusing on our problems or our source of anxiety. And this helps keep our fears from snowballing from one catastrophe to another, which so often happens. Practicing gratitude also helps to reduce the feelings of helplessness that today's stress can easily create, which then increases our anxiety, right? It helps us to sleep better. It releases toxic emotions and stress hormones. It provides a more positive outlook on life, thereby making us more alert to our blessings, which turns our hearts to the blesser. And so we tell God about all we need, absolutely. But we do so with thanksgiving, focusing on, as verses 8 to 9 state, those things that are lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. I think sometimes we read this passage, we focus on one part, such as presenting our request to God, and we expect to experience the soul deep peace scripture promises, not recognizing that each step mentioned is but one piece of the equation. God wants us to attack our fears with each of these actions, remembering that he is with us, taking a moment to simply sit in his presence, breathing deeply in and then out while reminding ourselves that he is indeed present. Rejoicing in God, asking him to meet our needs and to fight our battles on our behalf, maintaining a surrendered and therefore filled heart, thanking him for all he's done and has provided, letting the God of peace, not our sin or our fears, rule our hearts, and asking him for the help to do so, and intentionally shifting our focus off of whatever has elevated our stress and our anxiety and onto the things of God. That is how we learn to live more consistently, more progressively in the victory of Christ, the victory that we already possess in him. Hopefully that gave you a few things, maybe just reminded you of some things that will help you, that will bring those truths to mind the next time you're struggling, maybe gave you some passages to read through. I would actually encourage you to read all of Philippians and maybe read through it a few times. The first time I would encourage you just to, to pay attention to heart positions that Paul revealed, the author Paul revealed, his emotions, his attitudes, his perspective, and the truths that he presented and think about all those things, maybe write them down in your journal, and then bring all of those truths to chapter four, where Paul tells us not to be anxious about anything, but to turn to God with everything, with thanksgiving, with praise, and to focus on those things that are good and lovely. And that may not solve all of your anxiety. I mean, I think for some of us, this might be an ongoing battle, but hopefully it will just decrease your fears bit by bit by bit by bit, helping you to grab hold of the victorious life that Jesus died to give you. Thank you for listening. I do hope today gave you some encouragement, some things to think about. If you haven't already done so, I would encourage you to subscribe to this podcast and then you won't miss a single episode. Share it with your friends as well and make sure to rate it. That encourages our team and it helps others to find it as well. Until next time, may you live as one who truly has been set free. Faith Over Fear is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you liked what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review this podcast in your favorite podcast app. 
so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com.